and now let's say it's Ebola comes along, you're going to have 50% of the population who aren't going to take a vaccine because it was mismanaged and the propaganda was so strong and polarizing. And I get it was complex and we were running fast, but we were lied to and, and, and we're now finding out that a lot of that was covered up. And that's, that's government testimony, that's Fauci's testimony, that's the Senate, that's the, Sur the Surgeon General of America. Look, I'm not a conspiracy guy, but I started digging in because I'm like, hold on a second. I was part of the media saying, yeah, get vaccinated, you know. And then now you're like, hold on. Now everybody's saying that all this is happening. And I've had friends who've had heart attacks. And you're like, hold on a second, you know. And so I feel duped. Okay. Go. Whew, okay. Pals, I think you're really going to enjoy this video. If you do, please hit the like and subscribe button and comment button. It really helps out. Do you believe that you can change someone's mind through debate? Absolutely. I just don't know, like, what's one policy that Donald Trump has given if he comes back into office is going to help inflation? Just one. He's okay, going to be doing tariffs. And that makes things more expensive. He's also going to be mining. I did a 1v20 Jubilee thing yesterday. What's that? Like, I sit in the middle and there's 20 conservatives that all come up and take the off. Why do you hate American manufacturing? Because I hate America. I don't know. What, what what kind of a question? No. You've debated Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Alex Jones, Candace Owens, Andrew Tate. So it seems to me, obviously, Alex Jones would be different than Ben Shapiro. Alex Jones seems more bullyish. No, you're lying. He got back to the wire. Uh, Mark Meadows delivered a note Mark on his Meadows. desk. We're going to spend 30 minutes with me repeating that same question. We need to be in the same factual reality. Ben Shapiro probably be more of an appeal to um, like factual foundations to build up arguments. In general, I agree with you. As a member of the alternative media, okay, alternative media. I actually really enjoyed the Destiny Ben Shapiro debate. I thought that was one of the better ones. Media is a huge mistake because there's no accountability and there's no gatekeeping. And as much That's as- That's us, folks. It's a, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs, but Ben Shapiro really is like, I want to be careful here. He's uh, one of the more reasonable conservatives. Now, I'm not saying that he doesn't lie or obfuscate or any of those things, but he's not in the same ballpark as, you know, like Dave Rubin, for example. He's not a complete f idiot. It's going to be fun, light, relaxed. Uh, I was curious if you have or will talk about the Twitch adpocalypse. Seems like super unfortunate timing for you, especially since I've heard politics related channels have been hit the hardest. I mean, I noticed it last week. I noticed it like Nine days ago, I looked at the ad revenue for the streams and it was zero. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if this has anything to do with a uh, Hassan and them. You know, it's not fun when stuff like this happens. But listen, I've been around for 15 years now and I've, I've been I've been a part of I, I've, I've experienced multiple adpocalypses on multiple platforms. And so it's just it just comes with the territory. You just you just accept that like if you're going to do this kind of stuff for work, you need to be somewhat comfortable with with volatility. It's just an extremely volatile line of work. There's ups like crazy ups, crazy downs, and you just got to kind of roll with it. And sometimes sometimes it can be stressful, but honestly, at this point in my career, stuff like this happens and I'm like, oh, that kind of sucks. And then but, you know, it is what it is. Relaxing, fun, good stuff. Oh, is that the mood I need to be in? And then hard hitting. <laughs> then I'm gonna zap you with hard hitting. Gotcha. You ready? Hit as hard as you want. Destiny. Stephen Bonnell. Bango. Let's We're go. here. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Destiny. It was your gaming handle. Yep. When you started out. And why? Why? The, why did Twitch kick you off Twitch? When you were too good. You won too many games. We can go with that, but um. <laughs> I, uh, I made a bend towards politics in 2016. Yeah. And my ban from Twitch was 2022. And yeah. I was kind of fighting with some of the more radical trans community people. Oh, okay. um, and even though I'm pretty to the left on trans issues, I wasn't quite as far as they were. And I was fighting with some of them. And then I got you caught up. You can never in... be left enough. For some people, yeah. Yeah. I have, I, I'm very excited to talk to you. I, I, what the right does well is debate okay. and um, you know I, I look at I look at I see Tucker Carlson and he even looks like with the bow tie and everything like the kid in high school who was on the debate team and you kind of didn't want to get into a fight with him because he was going to kick your ass in, a, in a, obviously not in a physical way but in a mental way I, I keep seeing this some people are saying there's no general adpocalypse it's only for political content general ad revenue is up for this month I keep seeing this but it's absolutely the case according to reporting that 10 Fortune 500 com companies pause their ad spending on Twitch right now. And it, it, it's also true that some tags 
got caught up in the adpocalypse. Like there was a streamer who had Iranian as a tag and they got demonetized. There was a streamer who had black. That was one of his tags and that got him blocked as well. And so there were, there was a, there was collateral damage. Uh, it did extend beyond like outside of the political sphere. And you're sort of the token, you know, good debating, you know, liberal, let's say, if I'm allowed to say that, right, right, left wing, left wing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel and, like a center left liberal. But you've, and just tell me if I'm wrong on any of these, but you've debated or talked to or had it out with Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Alex Jones, Candace Owens, Andrew Tate, Piers Morgan, basically the A-list of, of right debaters. Yeah, most of them, I think, at this point, yeah. And why are you, well, why? Why, um, well, that's what? a complicated question. <laughs> are we, um, wait, are we live or are we shooting? We're live. Okay. Uh, I've debated different people for different reasons at different parts of my career. Yeah. Um, in 2016, there was a whole movement where all of the gamer people decided we all wanted to become political. Yeah, uh, why? Gamergate, um, because women were trying to put uh, women in our video games and we couldn't have that and it was just it was a whole thing some grievances were legitimate some were stupid but whatever right. um, but at that point in my life hold on you got political because women were trying to put women in the video games yeah that's how I'll say it but other people will say it's because um, woke people or social justice work. in so many ways when I look around it feels like we're living like it feels like Gamergate spread to like everywhere and then it spread to politics. You know what I mean? Does anybody else get those same vibes? Gamergate was not about that. Gamergate was, well, when you ask the Gamergaters, they said it was about ethics and journalism. Um, but, the, but the initial like, God, the story is so crazy. This guy had a blog and this guy blogged about his ex-girlfriend that cheated on him. And his ex-girlfriend was a game developer, an indie game developer. And... He accused her of sleeping with game reviewers and the implication was that the game reviews for her games were influenced by sexual relationships. And th there was one guy, Nathan Grayson, who was, who was named like personally named. And I don't even think that he reviewed her game. And so there was a ton of like information that initially came out that just ended up just being completely false. Um, so that, that, that's what kicked it off was this guy, this guy was, was pissed about his ex-girlfriend cheating on him and he wrote a blog post and then, and then it turned into like, I don't know what involvement Brianna Wu had in all this, but, but Anita Sarkeesian, who was this, um, feminist writer who, you know, was pushing for video games to be more inclusive and more and more feminist in the way that they were presenting like gender roles. Um, and there was a huge pushback from people like Sargon of Akkad and Milo and oh, man. Yeah, that was 20, 20 years ago. I'm sorry, 10 years ago. It was 2014 when, when all that kicked off. But Steve Bannon said that he saw in Gamergate, he saw potential. He saw a block of angry young men that he could potentially sway to his side politically. He looked at Gamergate like it was an opportunity to, to grow a political movement. And um, to that end, he was essentially correct. Yeah. Warriors were trying to ruin video games by making them too woke or whatever, like people complain about. So it's like an anti-woke movement. Kind of, yeah. yeah. That's a negative way to describe it. That's how I would describe it, but obviously right. people on the other side would describe it in a different manner. Okay, but saying women want to put women in video games sounds a bit uh, incel. It does. Yeah. But again, that's that's my perspective. Okay. But good. they would describe it differently, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I also got political as well. Um, I'd always had an interest in politics. I grew up very. Gamergate was really the genesis of like the massive anti woke kind of movement that sprung up in recent times. Very conservative. My mom is Cuban, um, and wow. so Cubans are very, very conservative. Very conservative. Well, Cubans here. Um, are very conservative. Probably the Cubans in Cuba. <laughs> I've been to Cuba a bunch of times. I mean, there's still... Do they like it there? <laughs> I do. I mean, look... Uh... No, no, do the Cubans like it there? Are they supportive of the regime and everything? Or I would well, say different things because Cubans in America will <clears throat> tell me how much Cubans in Cuba hate Cuba. Yeah, but because they were kicked out. Um, look, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer because I don't know who's telling the truth. I've, I, I think I, I, I've shot there like three or four times. I've been there maybe five times. Okay. Um, happy. A lot of people are definitely pro uh, uh, Fidel and and pro quote unquote communist. It's a weird kind of communism. Um, you know, they they have like the best cancer lung cancer doctors there, and you know they were sort of pro, and they have the best lung cancer doctors because they all smoke sure. the tobacco. 
Back in the day, they called it anti-SJW. True. When did they start using, when did Republicans co-opt woke? Because woke started as like a BLM adjacent thing. And woke was about like, stay woke meant stay educated on how the system can f you as a, as a minority. And then the Republicans co-opted that word to mean, you know, lesbian couples in the Star Wars show. But when did that happen? Yeah, I want to say it was like 2017, 2018 is when they started to really co-opt it. Okay. But uh, they have also diabetes because they have sugar. But anyway, uh, I, I, I mean, they, they seem pretty happy. I, I don't know. Okay. But yeah, I, conservative here. I got it. Sure, yeah. Anyway, so you grew up in a conservative family. Grew up very conservative, very Republican. Wrote yeah. articles for my school newspaper defending Bush, the Iraq War. Very conservative. Mm -hmm. um, as I got into streaming. That's a hard thing to defend. Um, no, in when you're conservative, school. you can defend literally anything. Look at Donald <laughs> Trump. Um, maybe we'll get into that. Right. But um, yeah, as I got older, especially once I got into streaming and I started to make a lot of money, my political views started to shift a lot. Sorry, how did you make money streaming? Just because you're such a good gamer? Uh, well... So in 2010, I started streaming. It was like a new technology. Mm -hmm. It didn't really exist that much yet. Not many people did it. And I I played video games and it was funny to watch. Mm -hmm. um, in real life, it was like fun to play games and talk to people and everything. Mm -hmm. And I could translate that online really well. And people started kind of donating on PayPal, like here's five bucks, like, you know, keep it up. And I think after a month in December, I got paid like $200 mm -hmm. in revenue for this. And I compared that to my current job. And I was like, well, if I just did this full time, I'd make the same money. So mm -hmm. I should just do it It's more time. fun. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, and ha when you started making a lot of money, then what happened? I my It turned into a job for me kind of like accidentally. It was Q4 2009. Machinima had been uploading my videos and for some reason my videos were just crushing it on Machinima with just so little effort and but they paid quarterly back then, so I wasn't seeing the money like right away. And then I had a girlfriend of mine cheated on me. I had moved to San Francisco and then to like live with my girlfriend at the time. And then she cheated on me and uh, I moved back in with my folks. The videos were crushing it so much on Machinima that like I used that time to like springboard into change. No, this was no, this wasn't the Liz era. No, no, no. And so I hit up Machinima and I was like, hey, do you guys want to just hire me salary? And then they flew me down in, in January or maybe February of 2010. I had an interview. They lowballed me on the salary. I eagerly accepted it because I didn't know any better. And uh, and then I started working at Machinima, I believe in April of 2010 was when I officially started. I could be wrong about that. Um, but that it, it turned into a job for me, like really quickly. Like it all happened very, 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 very quickly. My political views, I think, started to shift significantly to the left. Why? Um, I think that when you are, um, hold on, I'm trying to. Usually it's the other way around. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to think if I'm in a <laughs> combative mood or if I'm trying to be in an empathetic mood right now. You could be um, both. I, by the way, I'm not combative at all. Yeah, but I'm trying to think for the audience. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. what people tune me out when I start getting mean. So growing you can up, get what was the lowballed salary? The first year I got paid forty thousand a year, and I believe just off the ad revenue, I had made close to twenty thousand in the span of maybe th three months. But I was willing to take the pay cut because I wanted to get I, like I was looking for experience. I actually don't regret it. I mean, I regret not asking for. I should have asked for more. Like I asked Sark at the time. I was like, "Hey, they offered me forty. What do you think?" And he's like. I would ask for 60 is what he said. I was like, no, I don't want to push it. But I was making way more money off ad revenue, but I just, I wanted the experience. I wanted to get experience hosting. Sark was a really good person to work with to get that experience because he was just so good at that stuff. So yeah. I mean, that's fine with me. Uh, yeah, okay. Growing up, I think it's easy to feel like when you are dispossessed when your financial situation sucks when everything in life sucks mm -hmm. um, there are elements of libertarianism or conservatism that feel good because you feel like you can take control of your life at least like mm -hmm. i i do have the ability to become a millionaire i do have the ability to get me sure. out of the situation and that, that agency feels good you don't think of yourself as a victim mm -hmm. and yeah so i was probably my most conservative most libertarian when i was like on the verge of losing my house cleaning carpets just a bad horrible situation in life with mm -hmm. a lot of roadblocks to get there or, or stumbling blocks to get there but when i started to make money one of the things that i noticed was immediately how different so much of my life was and then so much of my son's life could be just because I was making a lot of money and I was like oh this is bullshit this is insane how different and easy life is yeah. how many mistakes I can be afforded uh, what the access that I have to so many different things now whereas before my life was like 
horrible. So I think my views started to change a lot. That's amazing <clears throat> because usually it's the, I don't know, it was Churchill who said. Yeah, you start off as a liberal or you don't have a heart and it, then you become a conservative. You don't have a brain. brain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, I, when I was young, I had nothing. I was liberal because I was left of left because I was like, well, we should all help each other out, including me. And and then when you get a bit of money, you're like, do you know how, how much taxes? Holy. Anyway, um, so we got we got into that. Now, I I want to talk to you about a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, one of the things about this podcast is, I, you know, we get to talk to the most interesting people. When I was researching you, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. Was that your first job with salary negotiation? Yes. Were you ever offered the inside gaming spot at the time? No, it was, uh, I was always going to work with Respawn. Somebody asked if, how much do you think I could have negotiated for? I think I could have got 60 the first year. I think I could have, if I, I, I think I could have got 60 cause I was like hot, you know, I was hot, hot, like, um, videos back then with Hutch in the title were just popping off, uh, with call of duty stuff. And I have 74 pages of this. So, so you maybe we have to do a lightning round. Sure. Whatever you want. Um, my flight leaves in seven hours. So there we go. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's get into it then. Um, the basis of this show is during COVID, I was talking to Rogan about this, like during COVID, because he does a comedy bit about it, but during COVID, you know, social media exploded, you know, and casual name drop, you know, fringe humble brag became less fringe. We were just, no, I was talking to the producer of the show in the last presidential debate, like five of the topics of this thing, which is basically, basically let's find the biggest things on social media and then attack them like investigative journalists and go after and sort of figure out what's going on. And five of the, of this quote unquote, you know, radical things we were doing were, 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 were in the, in the presidential debate. So it went from sort of, you know, X being the fringe to X, you know, being policy. Uh -huh. And so <clears throat> one of the things I want to talk to you is how did we move from and you know because you've debated all of these cats how did we move from this sort of fringe you know uh you know conspiracy theory world to all of these people moving into the sort of mainstream and be, and debating you know people online as soon as it became profitable to for alternative media as soon as it be, as soon as you could make a lucrative living kind of selling red meat to whatever political base you have in, in terms of your audience I think that's when it was like doomed to, to just become completely unhinged and go off the rails because there's just no guardrails with alternative media, like none, zero line and, and, and basically bypass all this sort of mainstream media. I mean, there's like five or six different psychological phenomenon, I think that underpin kind yeah. of that shift. Um, <clears throat> I guess one thing I'd start with is if you seen the movie Bruce Almighty, mm -hmm, sure. There's a there's a very deep I don't know whether it's deep or not or maybe this actually came from um, from uh, Futurama but uh, th there's a there's a part where God says something along the lines of when people know or when you've done something really well people don't know you've done anything at all and I think that we have an issue in society where there's a lot of stuff that runs well but we don't know why it runs well and so we take it for granted mm -hmm. and once you've taken things for granted um, it's very easy to look at a thing and go well this is probably total bullshit. Mm. Um, you know, you, 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 we can go to any restaurant we want and more or less get food and be fine. And we don't really think about how much goes into me ordering a thing to eat and eating it and trusting that, sure. that there are so many steps in transportation, refrigeration, the FD, there's yeah. so much going on. Yeah. And, but if you don't know anything, right, when you don't know anything, everything can become a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think that the lack of understanding of like basic civics, basic mm -hmm. science, like the, how the government works, institutions, because we don't have the understanding. Seems like the seeds of conspiracy, like, so we've had conspiracy theories for a really long time. It's not like they're new. JFK was a big conspiracy theory for a while. Um, it was like the, excuse me, conspiracy theory for a really long time. But I think 9-11 really, 9-11 really made that ground fertile for conspiracy theories. Uh, how many of you guys watched Loose Change 20 years ago, whenever that came out? The Zeitgeist films? Are those the same films? Loose Change was, I feel like it was, it's been a long time since I watched it. I think it was roughly a three hour sort of amateur documentary style movie um, that, that called into question the 9-11 itself, you know, was basically laying the groundwork for, I think it just came out. I don't know if they, 
I don't know if they accused George W. Bush of orchestrating the whole thing, but they definitely started the whole jet fuel can't melt steel beams kind of thing. Um, I think after 9-11, people started to get like way more into conspiracy theory. And then it really, 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 really took fire during the Trump era. Um, the ascension of QAnon, I think, um, was, was a big part of, of like the Trump era. And now, now it's, I don't know how to estimate it. Now I feel like there's like a full third of the country that are deep into conspiracy theories that are deeply skeptical of anything that comes from any kind of authority. And so they're, they're hesitant to get the vaccine, for example, simply because scientists said that it's safe. Because they heard a scientist say it's safe and effective, that makes them inherently distrustful of that just because it came from a scientist. So any kind of authority figure, aside from Trump, obviously, uh, they, they view with, with, with tremendous amounts of skepticism. Understanding and nobody spends time defending them because you take them for granted. Now everybody is questioning everything. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then there are, you know, there are other things. Well, That's also, thing, do you think there's any justification or basis for that way of thinking? It's not that you should uncritically accept everything, but conversely, you shouldn't be inherently deeply skeptical of everything. So a healthy amount of skepticism, I think is fine. I think it's fine. There's good reasons to be, to have some level of healthy skepticism, especially after what the Bush administration did with respect to intelligence reports regarding possible WMD in Iraq and basically painting, painting a picture that, that Saddam Hussein and, and Osama bin Laden could have been working together. The Bush administration was responsible for you know, I, I think at the time, the poll at the poll, the polling at the time back in 2003, when they were really pounding the drumbeats of war, I think it was 75% of the country thought that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. So some degree of skepticism is fine. Getting a second opinion, if your doctor gives you a diagnosis or if your doctor tells you that something's going on with your body, getting a second opinion is fine. You know, all these things are fine. It's just... For a significant chunk of the country at this point, they're skeptical of everything, of everything. And just as I don't think it's a good idea to just accept everything the government says and never have any questions and never question the people that are saying, they say like, I'm, no, I don't think that's good, but I also think it's con it, the inverse is true as well. Just, just being skeptical of everything is how you get to the, to the point where, you know, massive numbers of people in this country are anti-vax like Nick Merckx tweeted the other day that his son who I think is around two years old his son has zero vaccines zero zero hundreds of years of scientific progress eliminating all kinds of of, of nasty viruses and diseases diphtheria hepatitis polio you know hundreds of years of 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 scientific development to, to you know, it, diphtheria, for example, is nasty. It's a nasty, nasty, nasty virus, I believe, right? Or is it a bacteria? And once we came out with a vaccine for it, we went from a million global cases a year down to like 2,500. The measles, you know, smallpox, whooping cough. And, and I have no doubt it's because Nick Merckx probably consumes a lot of right-wing content who have been very heavily dabbling, like dipping their toes in or just outright supporting anti-vax stuff and having your kid have zero vaccines. And he also claimed like, oh, you know, our, we were working with our pediatrician who advised us that our, our son doesn't need the vaccine. It's like, what, what pediatrician told you that the vaccine was dangerous, that you shouldn't get it? You know, there's a lot of, you know, which we delve into the show as well, like disinformation, misinformation. I mean, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, openly says, yes, we're trying to, you know, the Free Syrian Army, Iran, uh, North Korea, which I've been to four or five times, will tell you how they, just how they do it. I've been into the rooms where they do it. Uh, Russia, you know, I've talked to Lavrov, the foreign minister, about that. And I'm like, why are you trying to, you know, and he's like, you have the ruble. You put sanctions on you're trying to screw up my country. We are openly trying to screw up your country. So there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation um, going out there. Now, how about jumping into our first big topic that you know a lot more than me that I just sort of found out about. Speaking of disinformation and misinformation.
Linda McMahon to lead the Department of Education. I mean, we're at a point now with his, his cabinet picks where I hear that and I'm like, oh, it could have been worse. Could have been worse. Could have been much worse. Could have been like uh, some podcaster or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's Vince McMahon's wife. Yeah. Information. She was the Secretary of Commerce during his first administration. There's a thing that uh, I, uh, with the dead internet theory, bots, AI, uh, you know, that, that, that claims like, you know, a, a lot of the internet is just created by AI and bots and a lot of who you're talking to. Go, educate me. I mean, it sounds like you've heard about it. You probably know more about it than I do, actually. Oh, God, I've, help us. I've seen a little bit about people talking about this. The idea is that some people will estimate huge percentages of internet communications are just bots communicating with each other. Yeah. That nuclear winter could happen, all of humanity is wiped out, and the internet carries on with people talking <laughs> yeah, to each talking other and whatnot. Um, I think that there is a lot of bad traffic on the internet, both in the forms of people engaging horribly and just bot nets that are yeah. engaging horribly and then bad actors that are engaging horribly yeah um the problem is it's so hard now the technology and the manipulation from farms of people even mm -hmm. it, like it's just so hard to determine what's authentic communication or not yeah um especially because we've we've created very fertile ground in the american mind to receive misinformation or disinformation so it makes these networks so much more powerful mm -hmm. uh, because they can basically amplify things that are already messing with our minds you know so going from misinformation, disinformation by state actors, let's go into something you do know about right versus left. So I, I, was, I did a, uh, a documentary with Obama where we brought the first sitting president to a prison and, um, and got a, a bipartisan legislation for prison reform. So it was very nice. So as a thank you, he said, you know, you can come film the sort of end of my presidency. And I, you know, I was a fan. I'm like, oh, we'll just go, you know, do a puff piece. And all he kept talking about was Boehner and the Republicans. And so that if you're doing a documentary, you have to go. So, you know, we went to talk to Boehner, uh, who's a lovely chap. And, um, and, 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 and then all he wanted to talk about was the Tea Party. And basically, you know, what Obama was saying, and he predicted it with Trump, is like, you know, we're not only trying to fight the other party when we get in we're trying to reverse what they did during their you know term so we're not even galvanized into inactivity we're going back into the past to try to rewrite history and but sadly that turned out to be prescient and the right versus left divide in this country has never been and as is being seen in this electoral cycle um and you debate all of these guys like why are we so polarized and why is there no consensus and you can't even boehner was kicked out by the tea party because he met obama he's the speaker of the house he that's his job and they kicked him out because the first amendment is a blessing and a curse you know i believe in the first amendment i think it's a good principle to have i'm not suggesting that government should crack down on speech but when people have free speech and you have so many actors bad actors that have no allegiance to the truth whatsoever it's all about a narrative it's not about the facts at all. And when you monetize that, that's a recipe for a lot of confusion. If you have people that are totally unscrupulous, have no regard for, have no kind of emphasis on relaying reliable information to their viewers, when it's just about their analytics, they notice that they get more clicks when they talk about anti-vax stuff. They notice that they get more clicks when they start talking about Fauci. That makes them more money and these people are just prolific they're just everywhere um it's a really bad combination and then of course if you have someone like donald trump who and i think like all politicians engage in deception subtle or overt um all politicians engage in omission in subterfuge to a certain degree it's just kind of built into politics i believe wasn't wasn't there a definition of politics that just means the art of lying? I believe it's I've, I believe I've heard politics defined that way. Donald Trump obviously takes these lies to just a really extreme degree. Um, he knows that his he knows that his cult of personality is so strong that he can lie about anything to any degree and his supporters will believe him. And so someone like Trump comes along and he further incentivizes these lies. And so I guess you can say the moment that we're in seems kind of inevitable in retrospect with the advent of the internet and social media and smartphones. Um, it's funny because when I look back on t in, in 2012 and 2011, when I was, um, when I was kind of a part of emergent alternative media, um, 
that's when that's when it was really kind of blowing up. It was like 2010, 2011. The internet was like really blowing up. And I remember being a part of that. And I remember feeling really optimistic about what the internet can do. I remember feeling like there were so many opportunities for people to become educated. It was going to be a lot more. I remember thinking it's going to be a lot more difficult for governments to lie to their own people now. It's going to be this empowering thing. And now I look at the internet and I think, oh boy, I, that did not happen. It did not play out that way at all. Now I look at the internet like a weapon, unfortunately, for a lot of people. They treat it like a weapon to be used for, for their own cynical purposes. I think that at a very, very foundational level, this hasn't happened yet, and until it does, we're doomed. Uh, people have to understand that as a, as a biological organism, you really have one goal and that's reproduction. That's yes, it. Yes, we are a grand so, evolutionary experiment. Yeah, so every single thing that is a part of your uh, biology is geared towards that. So some level of like survival, just you can survive long enough to reproduce and then hopefully take care of your, yeah, your offspring. Yeah, um, So when you look at how our minds work and how we perceive the environment around us, we're perceiving things that help us ensure our survival and things that make us like basically feel good, right? These are the things that our mind is equipped to have, uh, to, to to decipher and then to search for and to continue seeking out. People have a very bad assumption for humans that given a certain environment, um, you'll hear this ignorantly stated a lot like, oh, well, if we if we've got misinformation, we need more free speech, more free speech, that's gonna solve things. People think that if you throw a human in an environment and you let them you know, mingle and, and search for a while, they'll settle on the truth. But yeah, there's this naive notion that sunlight is the best disinfectant when it comes to these things that there's this belief that there's this belief that the best arguments or the most true arguments are going to just naturally rise to the top. I believe that the modern era has completely disproven this notion. It's the opposite. It's the exact opposite. What rises to the top is the most sensational stuff, the most sensational noise that confirms people's existing biases. That's what rises to the top. The, the truth or the facts of the matter, it, that, that's completely secondary. How does it make you feel to read this thing? How does it make you feel to have certain preconceived notions confirmed in, in your mind? Um, those things are just way more important. And, and, and now with algorithms, these algorithms are not written with, okay, let's prioritize having only the true things show up in people's feeds more. That's not, that's not how these algorithms are written. They're written to incentivize the most engagement heavy posts. Um, and what typically tends to, to, to draw out the most engagements or the most sensational, oftentimes completely wrong post. And so, yeah, this, this, this sunlight is the best disinfectant notion of how things will work with, within a free speech framework. It's just, it seems kind of naive in retrospect. That is absolutely not true. Right. Um, in the past, we would settle on things that were true, but it was usually because the truth was in service to ensuring like happiness or survival, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, if I told you a false statement that was not working in conjunction with that, you could immediately tell that what I said was false. So if I tell you, for instance, hey, um, we can go and breathe underwater, we could go and test that immediately, mm -hmm. and you're gonna very find, you know, find very quickly that's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. But if I tell you something like your phone is secretly spying on you and keeping a record of everything and sending it to the FBI, you have no way of ever verifying that statement. You don't know if it's true or not, right. but it, like, that might feed psychologically into something that feels good for you. Um, or if I tell you something about Fauci, or if I tell you something about um, Trump or whatever, like it feels good and there's no way to verify if it's true or not. Mm -hmm. So you have all of these people now that are trying to serve you things that give you psychological comfort and security, mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if they're true, but people don't realize that's what's happening. So that's the foundational issue is we have to understand how our minds work mm -hmm. so that we can design an optimal environment for our brains. Mm -hmm. And you know this because if you talk to the, I know this from having conservative uh, parents, right? They know this because they'll tell you, uh, I know my mom used to say all the time, garbage in, garbage out, don't watch trash TV, mm -hmm. it's not good for you, uh, you are who you hang around, mm -hmm. you know, don't keep bad friends yeah. because you're going to do, you have to bad, and then like, echo like, chamber, yeah. confirmation bias, bias, yeah, that, when you're in an environment, I remember, some of you guys may be too young for this, some of you guys, how many old people do we have in here, we got some old heads, I remember the big thing like, 20 years ago was reality TV, that was a sign that things were really declining, it was a sign that, our standards were rapidly falling. So there were, I don't know what it's, I don't know what really kicked off the big reality show craze. Was it the Osbournes show? I feel like the Osbournes, I feel like that show 
was hugely influential. And we, yeah, you can go back further to the real world in the 90s. That started in the 90s. Um, but I but I feel like the Osbournes is when things really started to take off. Survivor was big too. And there was a, there was a sense that we were declining culturally and artistically because of the rise of, of reality TV. And now it's just so much worse. Now with social media and content creators, it's just, it's like that times a thousand, you know? And so you have all these like fake prank channels and Aiden Ross is one of the most successful streamers on the, in the world. And that kid is a bona fide moron, you know? Just one of the dumbest people on the internet. The, f the current phase lineup, I look at that, I'm like, what product are you selling? What is this? I don't, I don't understand it, you know? Of course, I'm not the demographic. I don't think FaZe is trying to appeal to a lot of like 41-year-olds. But looking back, the concerns about reality TV seem quaint compared to, compared to the landscape now. Uh, things have, have for sure gotten dumber. There's just no getting around it. Like, it is just a lot dumber out there. I mean, it's very hard to rise above that environment. <laughs> so truly successful people, people have this misconception that very successful people in life just rise above all odds constantly. And it's like, no, a lot of being successful is creating a good environment for you to be successful in. Like yeah. that's like a huge part of it. You don't like a successful person is not fighting against the odds every day. They've mm. like prepared their success ahead of time so that mm. they can be successful, minimize distraction, stuff like that. Theo Vaughn was not on the real world. He was on road rules. He was on road rules. There was, there was, there was the real world, which is just like lock people in a apartment for like four months. And then there was road rules, which was, uh, and I remember, I remember watching him on that show. Actually, I, he, I told you guys this story, but I found him outside. I found him outside of my, when I was in the dorms at Sonoma state, I walked outside. It was 2 AM and I, I was going to go smoke a cigarette and I walk outside and Theo, Theo Vaughn is sitting there talking to one of the girls that lived in a dorm nearby. And I might have bummed a cigarette off of him or he might have bummed a cigarette off of me. And we're sitting there smoking. And then dramatically, one of the dorm, one of the dorm doors like swings wide open. And, and one guy is pushing one of his friends out of the dorm and one, and the guy who he's pushing out of the dorm is really pissed off and he looks like he wants to fight someone and he doesn't have his shirt on. And we're like, what is going on? And then the guy who's really pissed off turns around and there's a bunch of dicks drawn on his body with permanent marker. He was pissed, dude. And, and he look, he, he was so pissed and he looked so violent that, that I felt like if I laughed, the guy might throw a duke at me. I thought the guy might throw a fist at me. And so I'm sitting there like trying my best not to laugh, but it's just this surreal experience. Like how many times is this going to happen in your life where you're outside smoking a cigarette and then somebody emerges from a door with dicks covered. And so I'm just sitting there smoking my cigarette, trying my hardest not to laugh. Cause I'm like, if I start laughing, this guy's going to beat the shit out of me. That's my Theo Vaughn story. Yeah. Yeah being in the right place at the right time with the right product helps as well i mean it can help in the beginning for sure and there are yeah. people that get lucky but to consistently be successful and to create like a life where you're not just like one-off lucky not a yeah. you know yeah i mean i've met people who are one-off lucky but that one-off is pretty f big and and that's that's good enough. i mean preparing <clears throat> preparing for your success i mean maybe you know, I, 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 yeah, maybe. maybe. I th one thing I'll say. I'm not debating you on it. No, I understand. Yeah, it's, well, I feel strongly about this because successful people, I think, sometimes are the, the worst to talk to about how to be successful. Holy because, shit. Because what? I agree. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, because they don't understand sometimes the how they became successful. Or they understand too f much. The amount of successful people who want to tell me about what shoes I should wear and what I should eat because they're successful. I'm like, I don't. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the, they'll, sometimes people will like, there's a lot of successful people I've spoken to who will say things like, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I started, uh, I started stand up or I started this. And, you know, I think that you just got to go out there and kind of like be yourself and try mm -hmm. to be like the funniest version of yourself that you can be. But these people aren't aware that like you are, you are naturally, you're very, very, very funny. Mm -hmm. Like not every, it's like when you're trying to give advice to a guy who's 30 years old and a virgin and you're like, bro. It's like, I think there was a clip of who's the huge streamer. Why can't I think of his name i'm not i'm not playing it cool right now i'm just having a moment uh he does the he did the the elden ring stream and the mafia stream and he's actually doing a lot of really cool kai Sinat, yeah i actually think he's doing some really cool um really creative stuff he clearly has a really good team around him 
the plan content because I think they're doing really cool stuff. Like I actually think he's doing like I, w I would not put him in the same category as like Aiden Ross, Ross or whatever. Um, I don't watch a lot of his stuff, but I see this, the, the stuff that he does do. I'm like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. But I believe I saw a clip of him recently where he hit, I don't know, 300,000 or 350,000 or 400,000 subs, what, however many it was. And I think, I think he did a speech about, you know, go out there and capture your dreams. If you want to be a streamer, just do it. Just commit full time. Just go nuts with it. I, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it's like, bro. 99.99999% of people that pursue this for a living are not successful. So if you're going to, I'm not saying you shouldn't pursue whatever content thing you want to pursue. If you want to pursue it as a side hustle or, or, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to discourage people. I just think that people need to go into, I feel like people need to go into this thing with a certain degree of um, just being realistic about it. You know, I can't tell you how many times I can't tell you how many times over the years I've seen content creators um, start small and they have one video that like really blows up and then they quit their jobs. And it's like, it's like, bro, I don't know about that. It's like a good rule of thumb is if you can support yourself for six months in a row, then maybe it's a good time to quit your job. Um, and then I got really lucky with it too. I just got in, I got in when it was, I got in when there was way less people doing it and, 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 Especially in gaming, there were there just wasn't a lot. There weren't there weren't a lot of people in gaming that were doing it because you couldn't monetize on on YouTube doing gaming stuff. So you know, so yeah, I would not I would not suggest quitting your job and just pouring yourself into streaming and content with no backup plan. Some people do it; it works out for them, you know. But those those people, I don't think should be giving advice, giving that kind of advice to other people. I just don't think it's smart to do that. Just go out there, talk to the girl, be natural, you'll be fine. Yeah. But like your natural self might be really charismatic, witty, charming, sure. funny. His care, his ordinary self is not that. Yes. So yeah, I feel like a lot of successful people don't have a good time accounting for their success all the time. But, right. Yeah. Okay. Um. I so so to go back to conspiracy theories becoming now, you know, it, it's interesting <clears throat> because a lot of the conspiracy theories that we, we thought were conspiracy theories are now turning out not to be conspiracy theories. Not all of them, but, you know, some of them. Okay. I you super may... disagree with that, but we can get into really? that. Really? Yeah. Oh, that, well, good. Let's, let's get into it. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of naturally an anti-conspiracy theory person, and I, I, you know, I've been doing the news for 30 years, 20, 20 years professionally, I guess. But yeah, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, generally, it's the boring answer. <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. I've been to so-called, like, an Illuminati events, and where, you know, you have the big policy makers, senators and cabinet members meeting with the richest people um, and, and the biggest businesses. And they get together and they, you know, figure it out. There's no chicken blood. There's no, you know, Satan mm -hmm. worship. There's no whatever. But I mean, do they do they get together? Yeah. I mean, they and they have comedians do comedians. They have celebrity chefs and all this stuff. But a lot of this... Give your successful person advice for being successful. I mean, I'm not rich, rich, like... Hector, I have a lot of friends who are rich, rich, and I made a lot of really bad decisions throughout my career. Part of that was undiagnosed bipolar, unmedicated bipolar. That didn't help. But from my perspective, the advice that I would give is it's important to be dynamic. And I've seen a lot of content creators burn out on the kind of niche that they're, that they, that they were initially targeting. I saw it a lot with Minecraft YouTubers where you had these Minecraft uh, YouTubers that did insanely well, were really successful doing Minecraft content. And then after three or four years, they just burned out hard and just didn't want anything to do with Minecraft. And so for me, I've always tried to, oh boy, is this a new Dan game? Zionism dot what the, f what is this? Um, so for me, I've always tried to have, rather than like the game be the content, I'd rather, I, like, I tried to always have it be me, be the content. I don't know if that's good advice. Is this a Dan game? Zionism dot, what the f***? Zion, Zionist or Nazi? Oh, dear. That's definitely not a Dan website. Conspiracy theory stuff is coming out, and, and the liberals tend to think, okay, we're more educated. We live in New York and L.A. We don't believe this bullshit. And the, the, the right wing is sort of like, well, we know the truth because, you know, through talk radio or social media or what have you, we we we're we've we're like it's like um 
the, the, the Plato's cave. Like we've freed ourselves from the chains and we've walked through the flames and now we see the truth and we, we see it all because we, we have the real story. That's what Andrew Tate try, tries to go with when he talks about the matrix, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. The problem is a lot of the stuff that seemed to be bullshit is not necessarily bullshit. And you, you want to debate me on that? Yeah, I would, yeah. Okay, like, so, so go. So I think there's a lot at play here when it comes to, um, there's so much psychology at play. Um, so this is like a thing that will happen. Mm -hmm. there'll, be, um, there'll be COVID, okay? There'll be a thing like COVID. And then in the mainstream uh, for, I'll say, conspiratorial, it worked because I was like 15 watching you and CNN's World of War commentaries. And now I'm 30 still watching you stream politics. Um, that, th the other part of it is like that can be kind of challenging because um, I'm, not, I'm not a very complacent person in terms of my, my own standards for myself. Like I always want to be growing and learning and accumulating wisdom and avoiding pitfalls of the past and avoiding mistakes that I've made. And so that's just a standard that I set for myself. So over the last 15 years, I am, my life today is unrecognizable from the life that I was living when I was making Gary's mod videos. I'm just not the same person at all. Um, and so th that, that can be kind of challenging because if viewers get to know you and they get used to this one specific version of you, there's this anxiety that you being kind of a new version of yourself isn't going to have the same kind of appeal. And so there's a little bit of, I think if creators aren't careful, they're, they can kind of get stuck. They can kind of get stuck kind of being the same kind of thing for a really long time because people expect them to be that way. Yeah, anyways, that's just something I was thinking about. Tutorial stuff. There will be a ton of crazy claims that come out. Or I'll say, I'll just say a ton of claims that come out. All the way from Fauci is a billionaire funding gain of function research in a lab in Wuhan to cheers, China buddy. is creating and engineering a virus to come and attack us to it was intentionally leaked from a lab. All the way to maybe um, there was uh, legitimate research happening in a lab where this virus maybe got out from. Jump to protocol. Yeah, maybe sure. And what will happen is, is as the years go on, all of these theories that were very mainstream will fade away and people will find like the one thing that maybe has a degree of truth to it and they're like oh look the conspiracy theorists were right and it's like hold on we can go back in time and watch the media this was not the claim that you guys wanted to hang your hat on was that potentially there was a protocol violation and the virus got out it was the claim was that it was deliberately engineered as a bioweapon was the bioweapon angle. Yeah. I watched a lot of podcasts where people were talking about like this intentional crafting of like the super deadly virus. And apparently RFK Jr. is on camera some time ago theorizing exactly this. Uh, there was an article about it today. Where's the video of it? Many people argue that this pandemic was a pandemic, that it was planned from the outset, that it's part of a sinister scheme. I can't tell you the answer to that. I don't have enough evidence. A lot of it feels very planned to me, but I don't know. But I will tell you this. If you create these mechanisms for control, they become weapons of obedience for authoritarian regimes, no matter how beneficial or innocent the people who created them. Jesus Christ. So he's not outright committing to COVID being an intentional bioweapon, but he's just asking questions. Or whatever. But I will say, even for the COVID lab stuff, as we come to today and you look at the research, there still hasn't been any good, like all of the early, I think there were one or two studies that were published early that theorized it could have come from the lab. Like none of that research has panned out. And there's still no mm. good reason to think it came from a lab. Could it have? Maybe. But mm. more and more, it just kind of points to the to the market. Yeah, that's, I, okay, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. I get that. This is why I'm not a great debater. Because yeah, I'm yeah, like, you're that, fine. I'm like, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a bit of an M. This is so interesting. Um, what I'm talking about, and so I don't know if you heard us, but, but, so we're doing a thing on COVID. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> like, you know, one of the things you have to do is you have to double check everyone's bona fides. You have to get in, you have to do fact checking, all this stuff. Yeah. The reason why I, I find myself sort of drawn into this stuff, for example, not I've mentioned it before, but I'm reading this book right now. I'm listening to an audio book about various fascist regimes all over the world throughout history, from Mussolini to Hitler to Duterte to Gaddafi to um, this Italian leader in like the, the late 90s. Um, 
and and there's there's a there's a consensus view that the best way to lie to like to do massive lies is to do is to include some element of the truth in the lie and then expand on that in in disingenuous or deceptive ways and so you can take you can take for example let's say there's vid video foot footage of an immigrant beating the shit out of some white person or whatever you know, you, that that's a thing that happened right berlusconi that's the guy's name yeah very similar to trump berlusconi was very similar to trump very similar to trump it's wild how much overlap there is with berlusconi super corrupt and he f a lot of women um so you can you can take you can take a very real event like an immigrant beating the shit out of a white person but but if you use that event to to push a narrative that there's this epidemic of immigrants that are beating the out of white people that's when you know now that's now it's turned into this big lie but there's a kernel of truth at the center of it and so yeah authoritarians and dictators and fascist leaders throughout history have figured this out that 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 that's the best way to lie is like have some kernel of truth in there not where it came from because okay it came from where it came from is there was a big <clears throat> bunga bunga parties that came from Gaddafi. Gaddafi was the one who came up with like all of these fascist leaders, except for Hitler, like all of them had just a harem of women. Like Mussolini, bro, it was wild. Mussolini had members of his secret police go out and do scouting for, for women that he could like either sexually assault or have affairs with. But M Mussolini had dozens of, of sexual, ongoing sexual relationships. Berlusconi said it was... Berlusconi used to throw full on sex parties and, and women, he'd have women flown in from all over the world. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Wasn't it Berlusconi with the bunga bunga? I think, I think according to the book that I'm reading right now, Gaddafi was the one who came up with the name for that. The bunga bunga parties. I, I think, of, uh, uh, you know, so there were, I was a pro vaxxer. I was like, every, you know, got my kids vaccinated, everyone vaccinated. And, and, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of propaganda. It was government propaganda. And I understand why, because you're like, look, we have to get people vaccinated. We didn't know the, the severity of this thing. And I was just talking about uh, Fauci. I interviewed Fauci. I actually did a show called Shelter in Place because it was like, what's real, what's not real. There's a lot of misinformation. So, you know, let's try to get the information. And I understand, like, it's very complex. And mm -hmm. there are, and, and, and the vaccines were rushed, et cetera, et cetera. But I was just talking about Fauci's uh, testimony before Congress, and I'm like, hold, 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 hold on, <laughs> what? They're like, well, you know, maybe, yeah, you know, there has been an uptick in heart attacks. Oh well, you know, there are, and there's these rare things, and this is happening, and it could be bad for this, and it is bad for this, and, and you're like, what? We can go back to when I interviewed you, and that was not said in the beginning, and I think these kind of skeptics don't don't seem to make any space for our understanding of a dynamic event changing as more information presents itself. That concept seems to completely evade these people. Of course we know more about COVID now than we did in the first six months. Of course we know more about the vaccines now than we did during in the 10 month period that they were, that they were doing those trials. Of course we know more about how the virus itself responds to these vaccines than we did when we were testing these vaccines and so they treat comments made by fauci in the first six or seven months of the pandemic as lies instead of statements that were made using the best information that they had at the time and they attribute malice to something that can be explained by the fact that we just had a limited understanding of what this pandemic was in the beginning because of this so they turn it into lies. They say Fauci lied, people died. When really it was just these, these health professionals that were just doing the best that they could with the information that they had at the time. There's a fallout. And the fallout is now anti-vaxxers were, let's say. And then if you believe that they lied, well, now all of a sudden you have to, now, you, now like as soon as you say that someone like Fauci was lying, well, what would be the explanation for why they were lying? The only thing that could explain it is if he wanted to control you. Just like what, what RFK Jr. Was, was talking about in the clip that we just watched. This is a tool of authoritarians. They just want to control your life. They're doing it just to, just to do it, I guess. I, I, I don't understand how it would benefit any of these countries to actually do this. You would, you would have to be willing to sacrifice economic growth 
so you could exert authoritarian control over your people and then and then what to what end it doesn't make any sense but you have to take that position if you think that Fauci was lying then it's then it has to be this really deeply malicious intent this this need to 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 to, to, to control your to come in and tell you how to live your life and so then Fauci becomes this monstrous villain in your mind 5% of the population and now let's say it's Ebola comes along you're going to have 50% of the population who aren't going to take a vaccine because it was mismanaged and the propaganda was so strong and 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 polarizing and it turns out and I get it was complex and we were running fast but we were lied to and 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 we're now finding out that a lot of that was covered up and that's that's government testimony that's Fauci's testimony that's the senate that's the, Sur the surgeon general of america and I'm look I'm not a conspiracy guy but I started digging in because I'm like hold on a second I was part of the media saying yeah get vaccinated you know and then now you're like hold on now everybody's saying that all this you know is happening and I've had friends who've had heart attacks that there's a certain kind of genetic disorder that was uh, exacerbated by it. and you're like hold on a second you know and so I feel duped okay go Okay. Um, I talked before about this foundational issue with like truth seeking that we're not naturally truth seeking yeah. people, right? So here's a second foundational thing that I wish we could all start with, and yeah. because we don't start here, it destroys the conversations. Okay. Um, sometimes people can make mistakes, but in today's media landscape, nobody makes mistakes. It's always a conspiracy. And when I say conspiracy, right, I don't point. mean conspiracy, but like there's like a plot to like destroy the country, right? Yeah. So. I would never sit here and say nobody got anything wrong about lockdowns, about school lockdowns, about, you know, vaccines, whatever. I'll, I'm not going to say that nobody got anything wrong. But what I don't like is that when the other side starts with the foundation of they lied to us intentionally to put my. Yeah, they, can, they don't entertain the possibility that people were working with the best information that they had at the time with the intention of saving as many lives as they could possibly save. They don't entertain like it can't be that it has to be. They were just trying to control our lives and implant us with microchips and lay the foundation for a one world government. So we're all sleeping in pods and eating crickets instead of meat. Like it, it, it turns into like, and, and then a lot of those are very, are very, very closely linked to like explicitly anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories start to bleed into that, you know, and QAnon stuff. And it just takes a life of its own because that's the only way you can, you can explain if it's a malicious act, then it has to be this like vast global conspiracy it has to be. If this is true, then this would be a global conspiracy that would necessarily involve thousands or tens of thousands of government officials and scientists all over the world, just lying to us, just so they can control us. And if you're primed to believe that, then you have to explain that somehow. And so then it's like, oh, it's, you know, they're, it's a satanic cult and it's, they want to do a one world government or, you know, they want to do communism and it just turns into this thing and all that to avoid the possibility that. Well, actually, it's probably the case that these scientists were, you know, just acting in what they thought was the best interest of the general public at the time, trying to just save people's lives, spare people, you know, misery of dying slowly in a hospital over three weeks as you just slowly suffocate and, and can't take in any more oxygen. Just a horrible way to die. Microchips on us to fuck us over, whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, now, when we start the conversation over there, this is something that I think is a crime relating to the COVID uh, era is we never got to have good conversations about what should a vaccine mandate look like? What should the appropriate level of testing look like? What should lockdowns look like? Mm -hmm. Like, were some of these too far, not far enough? Because instead it's, well, did Fauci become a billionaire when he was <laughs> Yeah, became to politicized. Um, yeah, I, well, I don't even like to say politicized, but it's just when the foundational motivational assumptions start off so corrupt, now you have to waste so much time arguing over like- See, I've never even general. heard that Fauci became a billionaire. Oh, that was one of the big ones. Is he was invested in all these companies yeah. and became, and he no, intentionally lied to us. No, that's not else. what I'm talking about. Sure. I, I, but I, I will say that, like, and, and here's another issue, too, is people will point to times where a big one was over masks in the beginning. Well, mm -hmm. I think they did admit, they were like, well, we didn't want people to buy up all the N95s, and we weren't really sure, so we just told people to buy normal ones. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, maybe we shouldn't have done that. They can make mistakes like that. Or sometimes, you know, that was a dumb, that was a dumb lie. He shouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. They will make mistakes. But then people will say, well, you f***ed up. And then they'll go to the alternative media landscape. And the reality is, and I will die on this hill to any person, you know, epidemiologist, whoever wants to debate this, virologist, whatever, almost every single conspiracy about the vaccines was dead wrong. Mm -hmm. The mass injuries never happened. The mass myocarditis, pericarditis, heart problems, the mass death events, the ma all of these things, none of that happened. And 
everybody that was pushing that. You're a Tim Pool. But they believe it happened. Every time, uh, every time a, an athlete collapses on the field now, it's all because they were vaxxed or something like that. So Destiny's right. None of this stuff happened. Like everything that they were warning about, like none of it happened, but they'll find a way to believe it. Your Robert Malone's, your all the people that Joe Rogan, all these people that were pushing that, none of this panned out to be true, but nobody looks at them and go, oh, I don't think I'm going to trust that guy anymore because he was wrong about almost everything. Mm. They'll look at the one thing that he was like on the outer perimeter kind of right on, like, well, this guy mm. said this and the mainstream missed this. And the standard of, of proof or, or like the, the expectation for being correct is so lopsided that I'm like, no way. It was, can't, can't be the case that this guy was right about maybe this one thing and now you trust everything he says implicitly. We're just wrong about so many other things. Yeah. So first of all, I didn't mm -hmm. invite you on to debate you because- uh, Yeah, you're good, you're good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, seriously, I love just asking questions, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I see why you're you're the left's champion. Sure. You're my gladiator. But uh, my, so I'm just asking, myocarditis, mm -hmm. is uh, that's been proven that you're saying no? Um, There's a slightly elevated risk of myocarditis for young men after they get the vaccine. But we're talking about like a dozen cases out of 100,000 shots. It is a tiny amount. And your risk of myocarditis, which is, which, which is a mild inflammation of your heart that usually resolves its, itself within a month. You know, I'm not saying that that's, I'm not saying that that's, that won't be scary or whatever. You know, like I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize. So if somebody gets that, that would be scary, right? But the risk of getting myocarditis is actually worse if you catch COVID unvaccinated than from any of the vaccines. So the, the risk of myocarditis was massively overstated in right-wing media, in, in, in right-wing media. How many people in the country, 70% of the country got the vaccine. How many people do you, do you, does anybody in here know anyone that got myocarditis after the vaccine? You know, maybe some of you guys are tangentially or whatever, you know, maybe you heard of it, but like, I, I know I, everybody that I know got vaccinated and nobody I know got myocarditis. It's not that it doesn't happen, but it's a really low risk. Um, myocarditis, it, so there's two things to understand. So firstly, myocarditis is a side effect of the vaccine. Yes. Okay. Um, in almost every single age group, except for maybe young men, it's, it doesn't happen as much as it would if you would have gotten infected with COVID. So, so getting a COVID infection is worse. Exacerbates it. Yeah, it's, well, it's a, no. you have a higher likelihood of developing myocarditis yes. than if you get uh, the vaccine. If you have COVID. Yes. So it's a COVID activated thing, not a vaccine activated thing. Well, it's both. Well, I mean, kind of, both. I, I mean, both. both. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, I believe. Um, it's both, but for most groups, age groups and gender groups, for most groups, the risk of myocarditis is higher if you get COVID rather than if you get the Moderna vaccine. But even if you're, even if you're a young man where, where maybe the risk is slightly higher with the vaccine compared with COVID, maybe, even in that spot, it's, ex it's exceedingly rare. Really, really, really rare. I don't remember pericarditis and myocarditis. It's an inflammation of different parts of the hearts, but it's an, yeah. an, a, it's an inflammatory response of your immune system. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, but both went through the roof. But you're saying it's I wouldn't all, say they went through the no, roof. My understanding is myocarditis results from the vaccine. I want to say it was seven for every hundred thousand vaccines. It was very low. Mm -hmm. Number one and number two, myocarditis is an acute condition. You develop myocarditis, it goes away. It's, that's not like a, you have it for the rest of your life when you're. It's mm -hmm. like a, maybe your heart is inflamed for uh, maybe a week or two, mm -hmm. and it's just like some inflammation. You're not dying. You're not getting heart attacks. It's just right. like some inflammation. It happens. Um, in, yeah. in in some extremely rare cases, people can die from myocarditis. Yeah, but the results of that were, it was far less bad, and this is not debated by any serious person in the ever, mm -hmm. it is far less bad to get the vaccine than to get COVID. Right. Like you're always better off with whatever the outcomes uh, from the vaccine were, even if there was a very, very, very low chance that you might develop any, or there are, there might've been some more serious things that would happen, although that's very hard to track for statistical there reasons. Yeah, there was neurological issues, severe neurological issues with the AstraZeneca, which so severe that they pulled it off the... AstraZeneca mirror. had some inflammation issues. Yeah, that was in the UK. Yeah, but that wasn't an mRNA vaccine, which is yeah. funny enough. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'll say, and again... I, I, my recollection is that even in those cases, it was extremely rare, but they temporarily paused AstraZeneca while they studied it, and then, then I believe they resumed it. For all of these, there's like 10 hours of things that you could dive into. Right. One thing I'll say for like a statistical anomaly, though, that is important to keep in mind for the mm -hmm. mRNA vaccines, there were like billions of dosages of mm -hmm. these given out, okay? And one thing you have to keep in mind is that if I go live and I were to stream, if I were to talk to a million people mm -hmm. and I were to say, you know, the word flatulence, okay? Within a day of me saying that to a million people, 
two or three people might die. Mm -hmm. Now, is it because I said it or is it because there's so many people listening to me that maybe mm -hmm. somebody dies afterwards because they do, right? right? When you look at things like theirs, which is the vaccine adverse event uh, reporting system or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you can basically, anytime somebody has a bad reaction after a vaccine, it goes into this database, but that database has to be like analyzed to see, well, was it caused by the vaccine? Mm -hmm. Because anytime you vaccinate that many people, there are gonna be people that are having issues all the time, but you don't know if it was caused by the vaccine, right. which is important to keep in mind, yeah. So here, this, which brings me to another question I have. So you did a very good job there of re re reciting statistics. Mm -hmm. When I studied politics, you know, the first, yeah, I think, first year, maybe second year, you have to do stats. And then, you know, I remember I had like a Southern guy and he's like, you can get a stat to prove anything. What I find amazing, and I said this to Rogan the other day, is I remember like, I used to watch Tony Blair. I don't know if you know what question period is, but it's like the British parliament, you know, going out after, after each other. And someone would ask him some like super hard question and he would leap up and he would be, and he would have all the facts. And, he, and I think, you know, I think, uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy, RFK Jr. is is you know, his facts, and I'm like, if the facts are true, I mean, it's pretty compelling stuff. Uh, and, and we we did this thing on immigration, and the the you know homeland is like, well, 85 percent of the you know the people the after they're processed, they come for their, their you know they come for the meetings and whatever, and the and the Republicans, it's 90 percent don't come, and so you know facts. Where are we getting our facts? And like when you debate, it seems like a lot of this, I've listed out all these guys, mm -hmm. they rattle off facts. Here's this thing. And they've got their rap and they've done it a lot of times. So they know how to say it convincingly and well and with force. And I think a lot of people just go, oh, well, Ben Shapiro said it and he said it. it's 75 percent. And therefore, it's 75 percent. It's always been 75 percent. But there seems to be your facts my facts and near the twain shall meet there's the right there's the left and i don't know where they're coming from and so there's no like you know consensus on facts yeah um this is another foundational thing so much of this i get frustrated when i do politics because it's like there's so much groundwork like the, the difficult questions yeah. all are in learning kind of the frameworks yeah. and then you can contextualize things there we go a fact doesn't really matter that much mm. because a fact can be a, a, a Manipulated. fact well, it's not even so much that it can be manipulated. It can be, but true statements can lead you to untrue conclusions depending upon which selection of true statements you're taking, hmm. right? Um, like, it, like, uh, and we, we, could, we could think in our minds of a million different examples, right? That I could go into school and I could say, students that play video games past um, 1130 at night uh, video games will rot your mind's ability to learn in school. And you can tell that because all of them do worse in their tests, right? And I could study that and find that and not be true. And I could, I could, maybe I could even, you know, destroy a pro gamer in a debate. It's like, explain how 94% of students that play video games at midnight all score in this percentile of tests compared to these students that play video games only until seven o'clock and, and they, right? And you could, that's, these are true facts, they're mm -hmm. true stats or whatever. Mm -hmm. But maybe somebody takes a look at this and they go, okay, these facts are true. But well, here's something else I discovered, okay? Like 95% of, of students that play video games past 11:30 p.m. Um, have parents that don't care how they do in school, mm -hmm. right? So in actuality, that video game stat was kind of true, but it's not like if you took these kids and made them play less games, they do better in school. Their parents just don't care as much, right? And this type of thing is how a stat can exist and, and be a true stat, but because it's not properly contextualized and because people don't always understand, well, what is this stat really saying? Mm -hmm. People don't really know like what to make of it. A really good real life example of this is our median wages uh, when COVID was at its peak were huge, highest median wages we've ever had in this country. And then as COVID and the lockdown started to recede, our median wages started to plummet. And when you look at that, it's like, holy like the something is going on, maybe the unemployment insurance or you know government mm. something is we're getting. F but the thing is, is that if you take a step back and you think, okay, median worker wages. What question are we asking here? We're looking at the median, the middle point of the data of what the wages are of all of our workers. Well, during COVID, all the service workers and the poor people they all got laid off. Okay, so the only people working were work from homes, um, people that were doing much better paying jobs. White collar. Exactly. And so when you drop that whole lower section of your economy out, your median wages, of course, grow. And then as they start to get jobs again, even though your median wages are falling, this is really good for the economy because they're jumping back into the market, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you can go to like St. Louis Fed, median US uh, weekly wages. You can look at all this data, you can see it, and that it looks like something bad is happening, but it's not anything bad happening. You just have to contextualize the stat. But you can see like very quickly where you can get into trouble like looking at numbers, sure. you're like, oh, shit, I don't know what I'm actually looking and at. How do you debate 
I remember in Statistics 101 in college, they had us read a book called How to Lie with Statistics. And I believe like a lot of undergrads had to read this book. Or is anybody else familiar with this book? I hated statistics, by the way. I hate, I was so bad at math. But you know, how you present your, your, your y-axis, for example, that's like the classic example of, of how to lie with statistics is you manipulate, you manipulate the y-axis to make it look like there's these volatile swings when in reality they're like really marginal. People when, you know, some of the names that we said there, when they just start rattling off facts and therefore this means this and therefore this means this and you're just like, okay, well, no. Um, it's a, it's a, there's a whole, it depends on, for me, it depends on the person, it depends on the audience and it depends on the subject mm -hmm. and then it depends on my mood. Okay. <laughs> so, what's going on. Yeah. So, so that's why like earlier I kind of joke where I was like, I don't know if I want to be mean or empathetic when you, you ask go. me it. Because, but let's know. go through like, mm -hmm. okay. So it seems to me, obviously Alex Jones is, you would be different than Ben Shapiro. Alex Jones seems more bullyish and Ben Shapiro seems smarter. Jordan Peterson is different than Andrew Tate. Yeah. So how, how would you... So like, for instance, if I'm debating Alex Jones, okay, in my mind, he's going to be one of the most out there people, I might spend the entirety of the debate. Um, it might be over January 6th. And it might be, hey, who was the first guy to break into the Capitol building? He's going to say Antifa, or he's going to say the cops let him in. And I'm going to say it was um, Dominic Spizzola or whatever. The guy. Alex Jones is just belligerent. So <clears throat> it's really difficult to have any kind of productive conversation with somebody who just gets belligerent immediately. I just, I, I can't think of any context where it's productive to have a conversation in, with somebody like that. Guy was arrested. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proud boy. It's on video camera. We've mm -hmm. got in times. We see all of this. He's going to disagree with that, and we're going to spend 30 minutes. He did say that, Jeremy. It's true. With me repeating that same question. We need to be in the same factual reality. This is on video. We shouldn't be debating this, okay? Mm -hmm. And it will be there for 30 minutes at least, arguing that one thing. Mm -hmm. That would might be how I would approach that. Like, we need to be grounded in the same factual reality mm -hmm. before we start debating second order, third order, more abstract things. Right. Ben Shapiro. For Ben Shapiro, um, it would depend on the subject matter. I had a conversation with him earlier this year that I regret because I should have went way, uh, way more aggressively. Um, but it would probably be more of an appeal to um, like factual foundations to build up arguments because he's more kind of that archetype of like the facts over feelings yeah, debater. They yeah. seem very factual. Yeah, so I would probably fight back more on the like, hey, you're bringing up um, like this particular stat here. Well, what about this here? Or you might bring up this event here. You might say that Trump was good because he moved the embassy in um, uh, to uh, Jerusalem and Israel. Mm -hmm. And you may think that was a good thing. But what about when he agreed with Netanyahu um, to pull back all of the UNRWA funds or whatever from uh, from the Gaza Strip? And when they were and the tensions became inflamed because he moved that embassy, was that good? Like I might bring up you have like to do a lot of research. Yeah, for sure. For that, yeah. Andrew Tate. Um, I'm probably just going to try to bully him and make him look stupid because yeah. his whole thing is like the bravado and the masculinity. So when I argued with him on a Twitter space, he wanted to bring up Tucker Carlson leaving Fox News. And I was like, do you even know why he left? And he'd be like, well, because he was doing blah. And I was like, no, no, you, you have no f***ing idea. You're an idiot. Why are you talking about this? Right. It would be more. I wouldn't do that with Ben Shapiro because I would look unhinged. Right. But with Andrew Tate, when he. With Tucker Carlson, that it's just so fascinating how they're able to get away with so much. They're able to get away with so much. Tucker Carlson, his private text messages were presented as evidence in the defamation case that Dominion brought against Fox News. And in his private text messages, he said that Donald Trump was, quote, a literal demon. And now recent quotes from Tucker confirm that when he's talking about demons, he means demons. He recently said that he was woken up by a literal demon scratching at his skin and it left scratch marks. And he was being serious. Not a joke. He, he, claims to have ex have have this experience where a literal demon scratched at him and violently assaulted him when he was sleeping and he has scratch marks to prove it and so dominion they got a hold of his text messages and he's you know he's texting his 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 friends like oh this sydney powell person she's completely full of shit. she's crazy and blah 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 and then he would go on a show like four hours later and talk about sydney powell's evidence and her kraken and and he would lend credence to these false accusations of vote tampering against Dominion. That's why Dominion won, I think, I think the largest settlement of any civil trial in American history. They got $750 million, $800 million from Fox News. Fox News agreed to pay them the largest settlement ever. And part of the settlement was firing Tucker Carlson because he was, he was one of the people that was spreading these lies, knowingly spreading these lies. And then in his private text messages, he's texting friends saying, I think Donald Trump is a literal demon. And he just, he just got away with it. You know, like he just, he, he's still, he's still like a conservative 
He's like a pro-Trump conservative voice in alternative media, even though we know that privately he was telling people he thinks Trump is a demon. It's just, it just blows my mind that they're able to get away with this stuff. Like, how do you maintain your reputation after that? It's just, it's astounding to me. He's all about like bravado and masculine. Then I would do it for him, yeah. Right. And why, why and like, wasn't it advertisers, Tucker Carlson? Why was he? He left because he was intentionally he misinforming the public about Dominion voting systems, and he knew he was doing it the whole time, and all the text messages that leaked showed that. And he probably left Fox News. He was a massive liability for them. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. That's a good one. And so you, you have to, like, you're like Rocky. You have to sort of get all the fat. You're training all the time, and you have to get your all, fill your brain with all this stuff it's so you're lot, ready yeah. to go. Yeah. Piers Morgan, I mean, he's a blowhard. Um, for Piers, you're not so much fighting with him. You're, you just have to learn the format. It took me a few times to learn, but like when you're on the show, if somebody says something, you got to make the crazy facial expression so that he's like, well, I see you doing this. And then when you respond, you have to have snappy, punchy one-liners, maybe a joke, something to hit home with the audience. But like, if I'm on Piers Morgan, I'm never saying like, well, you have to understand the statistical analysis of this, blah, 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 blah. I'm probably going to say something like, if that was true, wouldn't you expect to see this, you idiot? And that would be it. And I would get like my laugh and that would be it. Yeah. All right. Jordan Peterson. For Jordan, I tried to appeal to his humanity more, where it was like, would this, does this conspiracy really make sense with this, whatever? I think if I were to do it now, it would be more of a similar approach to Ben, where it's like, let's just look at these facts. Like, what, isn't this more likely? Or let's, it would be something along He's like that. He sort of changed a bit, Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson just strikes me as somebody who is, you know, legitimately, like, mentally ill. That, that's, that's how I look at Jordan Peterson. Like, I, I don't think he's a well human being. Recently, he no. has changed quite a bit over found, the past found, few years. Found God and... Or yeah. was he always really religious? He's always been kind of really, he's always been pretty religious, yeah. You know, his uh, insane tweet about Elliot Page. Just when I read that tweet, I don't even remember what he said. He was talking about, oh, he was basically calling out the doctors who performed Elliot Page's mastectomy and, and was calling the doctors, you know, evil or something like that. It, it, I, I don't know. He just went so over the top with the Elliot Page stuff. It's like, bro, how does somebody else's decision to transition affect you that personally it's schizo is a good word for it yeah it's really schizo it's like really um intense like he took that personally when she got when she went through her tran transition or when he sorry when he went through his transition he took that personally all right well now i haven't even gotten into any of these things but speaking of debate well here i, I don't want to go after him for drug addiction i don't want to go after him for that um, I know a lot of drug addicts in recovery and, uh, you know, I do think that, uh, I, I don't think that drug addiction is a moral failure. And so even if it's someone super, even if it's someone that I loathe, I'm never going to attack, attack somebody for addiction issues. Um, but I do think, and, and, and the source of his addiction is kind of dark. I believe his wife had cancer, Jordan Peterson, and she struggled with cancer for like two or three years, which would just be devastating to deal with. And so it's not shocking or, or it, it, it's no surprise that when, when some people are dealing with a partner who is battling cancer, that they would turn to benzos. But Jordan Peterson did develop, as far as I understand, a benzo addiction that, that got so bad that I believe he had to go to a clinic in Russia and I believe they had to put him into an induced coma because his, his health had deteriorated so much. Um, I don't know if the meat only diet contributed to that, but yeah, it got, it got bad for, for Jordan Peterson for sure with the benzo stuff. But, but again, of all the things to go after Jordan Peterson for, I don't think that the benzo addiction is, is on the table. I don't think it's worth attacking him over.